Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spirit World Center. I'm joined here today by Peter Mark Adams, who is an absolutely extraordinary author. Uh, we've had him on the show before, uh, talking about the power of the healing field. And uh, he's just, he has unbelievable books on the esoteric and the metaphysical. He's a great researcher. Um, one of his other books is The Game of Saturn, Decoding the Sola Busca Terrochi absolutely amazing work and of course today we're talking about mystai dancing out the mysteries of dionysus and it's just an incredible book getting into the mysteries of the ancient world specifically these religious secret mysteries and uh, today we're going to unveil all of it so peter thank you so much for being here today oh, it's my pleasure eric pleasure so you know, this, this book, Mystai, right, it really struck me as just mm. something special. And it's, it's described on the website as the only full-length scholarly study of the ritual process of initiation into the mysteries of Dionysus, as depicted in the frescoes of Pompeii's Villa of the Mysteries. And everybody, it's available from Scarlet Imprint, it is an absolutely luscious and beautiful book full of just amazing illustrations and i just encourage everyone to check it out because uh, frankly if you're into the esoteric into spirituality it's just a look at how this very particular type of ceremony was practiced way back in the day but also it, it gives hints as to how ceremony has these fundamental pieces in it that help to make any kind of ceremony powerful and you can just see the the connection so peter i'm absolutely awesome flabbergasted to have you here today to talk about this <laughs> my pleasure let's get into it <laughs> awesome so um ultimately i guess for the the viewers they might be hearing about the mysteries for the first time ever um mm. so what are the mysteries they're voluntary um, devotional rites dedicated to a specific deity or deities. So um, they're not rites of passage, which are involuntary and everyone has to go through them, okay? So Mircea Aliade call them uh, rites of higher initiation. They're, they're a very distinct group um, of ritual processes that we see around the world that, that aim for a, a much um, bigger goal or target than simply um, achieving social integration. They go beyond that. They're enacted at night and the ritual process by and large is hidden beneath a veil of secrecy. Um, and, and it's kind of been bound by oaths which have actually worked for thousands of years. So. The incredible thing about the frescoes in the Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii is that they were preserved when the volcano erupted, Vesuvius erupted around 79 CE and buried the entire city in a very short time. And it's only due to that that we have preserved in this villa a complete sequence of ritual activity of initiation into the mysteries. Okay. It and you say secrecy, and I mean, that secrecy was intense, right? I mean, the Eleusinian oh, mysteries, yeah. it was the death penalty to, to reveal them. Yeah, the core process was, was totally covered in, in um, oaths that could lead to any kind of violation, hinting at what happened could lead to a death penalty. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And so what was the point of becoming initiated into the mysteries like if you had to give a sales pitch to to someone you know why you should come yeah. get initiated yeah i mean i think there's there's two things we need to understand about them the the initiation took place in two steps the first step was exceedingly common a lot of people uh, went along and took that ritual and that ritual was essentially a healing and purification rite so it had a far bigger application um, and was far more relevant, actually, to the bulk of people. Maybe one in 10 would go on and take the full initiation, the stage two. Okay, It was a tiny number of people. 
And even amongst that tiny number of people, some of them would be kind of frightened out of their lives and would like, you know, <laughs> not be able to obtain what it was that they should have been able to obtain from the initiation process. It was that overwhelming. It was that powerful. And it was practiced, you know, from, I don't know, at least eight, 900 BC through to fifth century, basically. So, you know, it's a period of 1400, 1500 years when we know the rites were actually being practiced in the Hellenistic world. But there's no doubt about it, but this is a well-honed technology of illumination. It didn't just spring up out of nowhere around 900 BCE, okay? It's just that we, we enter a kind of dark age at that period so that the evidence is, you know, for, for ritual generally is far more obscure, far more hidden, okay? But we can say for certain that around 900, 800 BC, the rites were being practiced and continued until they were suppressed by the Christian emperors, Theodosius and then Justinian. And so, there were there were competing strains of the mysteries, right? So you had like the rites of Eleusis and you had Dionysus. Were they were they in competition or were they no, like, really, could you take all of them? Almost any of the deities had mystery rites associated with it. Um, and just because you went to say the rites of Eleusis didn't stop you going to uh, get Dionysian initiation or Asclepius or, or, or Hecate. I mean, it, you, there was one Roman, uh, very famous uh, leader of the pagan resistance in the fourth century, Protectus, and you look at his kind of uh, titles, and he's been initiated into every single mystery <laughs> system that you can think of. So there was nothing exclusive about them. Um, they were open to pretty well anyone. But of their nature, they only attracted a small number of people who were prepared to take the extra steps and actually in the middle of the night descend into these rites and confront the deities because that's what it was that the mystery rite delivered, so to speak, direct unmediated encounter with a deity. So what kind of psychological profile do you think would fit the people back then who were undergoing this and like what kind of people would they be today you know what i mean um so what what type of person was undergoing these rites i, I guess very much you know human nature hasn't changed that much in millennia i'm guessing <laughs> uh, the same stuff that inspires us today to experience uh, higher orders of being broader mm -hmm. states of consciousness um a connection with the divine, a sense of the spiritual inherent in, in the life process itself, and of the other than human, uh, both in a kind of uh, animistic sense, as well as in the sense of higher order beings that we can communicate with and commune with through special ritual processes. So there was all that. Uh, but as I say, the, the intensely... Um, visited rites were the preliminary ones, not the right. main one. Okay, so people were going along there for ritual purification, you know, like they had health issues or like their, their life was going downhill or they felt that there was something in their ancestral field that was bringing a lot of ill health and bad luck on them, okay? And they go along for the preliminary rite, which was... Um, prerequisite if you were going to take the main right mm. okay so this prerequisite right was called myasis and it was designed to clear what they were in those days called miasma the, the ritual impurity as a result of injustice or murder or something even if it occurred in your ancestral line and the idea here seems to be that if you are to meet with a really higher order vibrationary higher order being you need yourself to bring a certain level of purity and clean energy to that encounter for it to take place 
So the miasma was thought of as contagious. So it could cont- act as a contagion in a ritual space. Mm. It could um, pollute ritual implements. It could make the right go amiss. Okay, because it provided a kind of entryway for much lower order beings Mm -hmm. and and, and specifically in in the Hellenistic context for the Arinyes, the the Furies, who um, were responsible for getting justice, okay, extracting justice at whatever cost, you know. So these these beings were kind of hovering on the edges of these rites and, and, and you needed to take extraordinary measures to ensure the safety of the ritual space and the purity and high energy in it so that it would function as a meeting place for the different planes of being which the ritual process was designed to engineer ultimately this isn't this is a process that hasn't changed even today i mean if you're doing any kind of ceremonial magic or healing even or anything like this you need to absolutely all the way up to the higher yoga tantra it's it's exactly like this today nothing has changed in terms of these protocols so yeah absolutely so so what makes the the murals um of pompeii here special like i suppose that they were they were preserved by the volcanic ash right and and so this is really the only pictorial insight into the mysteries that we have that that's one of the things uh, obviously that's the main thing but the the other thing is the quality of the artwork you will not see artwork like this again until the 15th century in in the renaissance and that's an extraordinary fact that is full fully figured artwork the the figures are almost life-size and possibly life-size that's that's one thing the expense spurred to to create this i can't imagine it's absolutely a stupendous work of art you know even from a secular perspective it's like a milestone in 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 human art history it, it really of its is sacred character it yeah. it has this other dimension it actually depicts the technology of illumination stage step by step pretty well and i remember hearing you mention before that even though i mean it's exquisite art it's absolutely amazing uh, it feels yeah. like those beings are staring out at you um, but you i've heard you mention before that there's a difference between renaissance art and what was going on here right that this was going by a, a playbook of of specific ritual depictions well as you know renaissance art yeah. is a bit more poetic i suppose yeah um we'll we'll get into the the actual um, fresco shortly, I think. Mm-hmm. So I may reserve um, comments Certainly. on that at the moment, but basically um, this is not a creative artwork in the sense that we understand advanced Renaissance art, like Michelangelo and Raphael. Um, it's ritual art in the sense that it has a very strict and limited repertoire and it is specifically designed to encapsulate the ritual process. Now, the important thing here is that, you know, we can like see spiritual and religious movements on, on a kind of spectrum. And at one end you have uh, doctrinal um, systems, which have typically top-down hierarchy. They have uh, a canon, definitive canon of text they have uh, authorized interpretations and they have a priesthood that monopolizes all of that machinery okay the the rites the mystery rites in general are not like that at all uh, they they're what we call imagistic and that's to say um primacy is accorded to generating the effect the the actual encounter with the deity and there's, there's no interpretation placed on that. How it comes to you is how it comes to you. And that's good enough. That's, that's, that's what you should have experienced. So the, the downfall of imagistic systems is that whilst they deliver a spiritual result, they are not documented in the same way that the doctrinal systems are. They don't leave behind a body of text and um, 
generally they don't leave behind a, a, an architecture and an artwork that allows you to recover what it is those people believed. Okay, so in a sense, the, the existence of this private fresco, the survival of this private fresco is an incredible window into a world that's otherwise lost. You know, as you said, the, the mysteries of Eleusis um, ran near Athens for a couple of thousand years, possibly, but th there's almost nothing remaining of that period. You know, there's a ritual site, you know, and, and that's about it. That, that is largely destroyed and, and we're left just to speculate, basically, on what the ritual was. Okay, so... Again, this is, this is the great weakness, but it's also the power of an imagistic system. And, and the mysteries of Dionysus were really imagistic. This was about immersion in a spiritual experience. Um, and so the frescoes, from my point of view, served a dual purpose. On the one hand, they provided a kind of uh, theater of memory. So that, you know, if a group is operating in this villa for any period of time, they have the frescoes as a way of anchoring their beliefs, their, their ritual process in something which, you know, will not disappear when the priestess dies or, or, or something happens, okay? So it overcomes that shortfall of, of imagistic type spiritual situations. And on the other hand, it provides a ritual space. So we'll have to think about the, the villa, the, the room in the Villa of the Mysteries that we're going to look at in two lights. One, literally daytime when you can read off what is presented there. And then at night when it would have been lit by flickering torches and these life-size figures would be flickering almost like a, a mirror of the ritual action that's being enacted in the central space. It's almost as though the supernatural world of the deities is, is, is like complementing the actual action of the ritual process in the room. Wow, we are incredibly fortunate that it has survived. And yeah. also that there are people doing this kind of analysis of it to see that, hey, this is not just um, this isn't just a wedding feast being depicted. This is a ritual. <laughs> this is a ritual room, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important. You know, you need to engage with the frescoes on a very high level of detail um, to be sure about your reading. Okay. Because what's depicted over there is an essentially Hellenistic ritual process, but we're viewing it through the lens of an elite Roman patrician religious organization or theasoi, okay? So the artist is conveying the Hellenistic ritual, but he's, <laughs> he's like changing the presentation for a Roman audience, okay? And, and one, I can make this a bit clearer, you know, the, the Hellenistic mysteries were very clear because we have their, um, their rules of play, so to speak. And that meant you couldn't spend more than a certain amount on a plain white clothing, okay? And the women's were allowed a very cheap sandal and the men were barefoot. And the women had to have their hair free. It couldn't be uh, ornated in any way, couldn't be dressed in any way. And there was no jewelry allowed. So that immediately it levels everybody. You can't distinguish the wealthy from the poor, you know? <laughs> So when we look at the frescoes, <laughs> we're gonna see some of the most richly dressed women imagine. <laughs> of course, these are, this is the Roman elite and the way they approach the Hellenistic mystery tradition is through their own tradition, okay? And, a, and an elite, elite tradition at that. So <laughs> there's like a double take, you know, when you see this stuff going on, saying, oh yes, that's, that's definitely Greek, but. <laughs> that's Roman. Anyway, we'll, we'll come to that when we go through the uh, rituals themselves on, on the walls. Absolutely. And you've, you've prepared a, a presentation for us, which I'm eager to get into. One thing I just want to say before we get into that is that it, it's one of these things with symbols, right? Once you know the symbols and you look at depictions, 
you can see it. But if you don't know the symbols, it's just, oh, it's just a work of art or it's just, oh, it's, you know, and, and, and so when you actually know the mythology, when you know the symbols that are being referenced, suddenly something can come alive and, and take on all this new meaning. I think that's, that's what you've really done here. It's fantastic work. I, I think one of the things I, I learned from working on uh, the, these frescoes for such a long period is that the artist uh, was not just a very highly skilled individual, he was an initiate or she was an initiate themselves and had to be for what they were about to do, depict over there would be forbidden for anyone other than an initiate. So that there's not a single detail in these frescoes that is um, there for a decorative purpose. Every single detail is purposeful and allows you to extract uh, a further meaning, a further depth from this rich depiction of the ritual process. Even down to the feet of the chairs, which you'll get into. Yeah, I'm sure, we'll, we'll in the come to that one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome well um i think i have share screen on here so shall we jump into things okay yes let me uh share screen okay look good yes it does awesome okay take it away so I just wanted to show these two um, figures because, of course, Dionysus is a specific uh, culturally bound um, deity. But, you know, he, he existed in Rome independently as Liber Pater. He, he existed amongst the Etruscans as Fuflons. And throughout Anatolia, he existed as, well, Attis, Adonis, uh, Tammuz, um, <laughs> And, and, and far to the east, of course, he was identified with Shiva. So the, although we tend to identify him with this rather beautiful figure here, um, the spirit of the deity as this indestructible life force um, spans cultures, spans millennia. Okay, so I just wanted to put that in, 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 in context there. And uh, over there is his manifestation as Tarhan. Uh, in central Anatolia, you see he's got grapes hanging from his waist. So, you know, almost unrecognizable as, as, as a form of Dionysus otherwise. Anyway, okay, so just to put the context on the Villa of the Mysteries, um, as you probably all know, the southern heel of Italy and Sicily were colonized by Greek city-states at a very early phase, like 8th century BCE. So the south of Italy, as you can see, Naples is, is to the north there next to Capua and Cume was one of the earliest Greek um, colonies. All of this area on the coast was Greek speaking. Okay, not <laughs> the interior was, was speaking Oscan and various other tribal dialects. Okay. Also, the Etruscans were still around, and to the north, you would have the Latins. So this is a real cultural and ethnical mix that we're dealing with. And in fact, I think uh, a dialect of Greek is still spoken in the heel of Italy, in the, in the more remote villages today. Okay, so now, just to interject for anyone who's listening to the podcast version right now, uh, you can see the the full video version on the Spirit World Center uh, YouTube channel and also on uh, Peter's YouTube channel. Uh, it's uh, complete with uh, awesome slides and maps. So uh, take it away, Peter. Thank you. So here's a photograph of the villa on the edge of Pompeii. It's like uh, 60 rooms. Uh, 3,700 square meters. This, this is a Roman patrician, a very high level patrician family villa, um, possibly part of the governing elite of Pompeii. Um, of course, the Romans took Pompeii during the social war, which was only over a couple of decades before the um, villa was, was taken over by the Romans. So this vast villa, you can see the layout on the right there, is basically something like six different suites within the space. 
and um, at the top you have the public area okay which very much you would have the clients coming there each morning asking for favors and so on right at the back of the villa where i've i've shown the two rooms in red is the furthest away from the public areas the most private part of the villa and it's in those two small rooms that the frescoes are found okay so it's the corner of the photograph that we're looking at pointing towards us that it's in there that you'll find the frescoes so there are the there's no way you could see these frescoes unless you were taken in there by a member of the family. Okay. I'm not even sure if the servants would be allowed access to this part of the house. Okay. It's extremely private. The frescoes were never meant to be seen by anyone other than the initiates of this Dionysian cult. So this is the small room and it has this kind of three bands painting frescoes, and each of the panels has a Dionysian themed uh, figure, a priestess or, or somebody doing the Corabantic dance. And from what we can understand, this is probably the room where they do the preparations. And then they'd enter through this small doorway into the main chamber, okay? And this is the ritual room. It's not vast, it's like seven meters by five meters, 35 meters squares. It's, it's probably enough for easily half a dozen or so people to conduct a ritual in. And I, I wouldn't have thought that the ritual process required more than half a dozen to 10 or 12 people max. Okay. The ritual frequency, uh, sequence starts on the left, runs along this kind of northerly wall across the east wall at the bottom and back to finish off on the right hand side. And so we, we'll just follow that ritual sequence. Now, what I alluded to earlier was the function of the room as a theater of memory. So that taking a priestess through this sequence would give them a very clear idea of the ritual process as it unfolds, okay? so. It embodies and records and stores that information. And not only the, the actions of the ritualists, but the interactions with the spiritual world are also recorded on here, okay? So it's an esoteric mapping of a profoundly secret ritual. And, you know, seeing the room at night would be very dim. Uh, and it would be lit with flickering torches. Okay, so they would be throwing shadows and, and illuminating different parts of the frescoes as the ritual unfolded. It'd really be a different experience over there. Okay, so we talked earlier about the figuration. And basically what I was saying is we, although it looks like high Renaissance <laughs> figurative art, it's actually very strictly circumscribed in terms of its postures and the gestures that are uh, depicted here. And I can prove that to you by comparing what we're about to see with this mosaic. This mosaic is from Algeria, that's to say a different continent. It's probably 300 years later than the frescoes. Uh, and it's in a completely different artistic medium. But the figuration is almost identical to that you'll see on the walls of the Villa of the Mysteries. And I'll just quickly go through, because visually you can immediately see that there's a repertoire of figuration that the artist has access to. Okay. And th this raises this, this big question that many people have are these depictions of real people or not? Okay, <laughs> because it looks like they're real people that we're looking at. And my answer to that is, although the gestures and the posture are kind of from the playbook of Dionysian initiatory figuration, I'm guessing that with such an elite crowd commissioning it, they had their own faces put onto the figures. <laughs> it's only a guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
I see. There's almost no variation in figure, posture, gesture. Okay, so we, we just go through the ritual uh, sequence now, if it's okay with you, Eric. Absolutely, yes, please. You're good to go. Okay. Yes, I'm raring to go. <laughs> okay, north wall. So we're just seeing the whole thing. Uh, and you see the just at the side there, the small entrance from the preparation room into the main room. And now taking each group uh, one at a time, what we've got here is the main figure of the woman with her um, arm akimbo. And you'll notice that she's actually walking her, the heel of her foot is up. She's moving into the ritual process. Um, the artist has made sure to dress her in a Greek dress. Okay, that's a peplos. It's not a Roman dress. It's a Greek dress. That said, he's put a scarf around her head, which we know the Hellenistic mysteries did not require. Women's heads were uncovered. But that is, a, that is the attire of a Roman priestess. Okay, so the artist is signaling to us that although this woman is a Greek, she's a priestess. And that characteristic uh, holding the shawl in the left hand is, is kind of characteristic of a Roman priestess. So signaling to us that this group, the woman, the child, and the woman overseeing the child are a family group. Because what we know about the Dionysian mysteries is that they were itinerant. That's to say, um, people would hire them, they would move from town to town, and uh, they'd be hired because they had a family lineage of performing these initiations. So it was kind of the stock in trade. Um, their reputation rested on their ability to generate the results, the expected results in the short time of the ritual process, which would be um, a nighttime ritual, okay? So a small boy there dressed in buskins is obviously a kind of um, reflection of the figure of Dionysus as a child. He's reading the liturgy. These children could be as young as four years old, you know, which is incredible. Um, and, and his mother or, or sisters, probably a family member, is supervising his reading of the lit liturgy in case he loses his place or something. So that, that is a distinct family group. We know that that is how the uh, rituals were enacted. The woman next to them, who is looking out from the flat picture surface directly at you, is proffering a small amount of myrtle. And she's wearing um, leaves in her hair as well, white poplar, okay. Now, as I said, the artist has gone to minute detail to convey specific information to us. The white poplar is sacred to Hades, okay. The myrtle being offered is what Dionysus offered Hades when he went down into the underworld to retrieve his mother, Semele. It's being offered to us though, as viewers of this fresco, it's an invitation to initiation, which is an incredible shift in the chronotype of the, of the fresco. So it's now kind of burst out of the <laughs> flat surface to address you as the viewer directly. In her hand, she's got a tray of, um, they're called liba, and they, they were honey cakes that were um, made in funereal contexts. And in this context, the context of initiation, where she is dedicating herself to Hades, which is the chthonic aspect of Dionysus, they are offerings to offset the Erinyes, the Furies, okay? Because while everyone else in this ritual space is initiated, and therefore protected, she's not, okay? She's carrying extra protection in the, ter in the form of the offering. Finally, on her feet, and it's unique, she has these kind of uh, moccasins. Uh, they're white and red, beautifully made shoes. And as far as I can tell, these must have been made specifically for the initiation. And I would guess out of, you know, um, uh, kid skin, very fine leather. Around her waist, I mean, she's wearing a simple shift or kit on. 
but around her waist is tied the hymation, the shawl. And, and as you'll see as we go through, it's purple. It's, it's the color most closely associated with Dionysus. Um, I want to talk here briefly about the titles of the uh, Greek initiator. We know she had two titles. One was Nymphae, which is Bride of the Deity. The other one was Dracaena. That's to say she's the dragoness. And in this Orphic ritual bowl, you can see the initiating priest or priestess is depicted as a dragon. And, and there's like a fierce energy emanating out into the um, ritualists surrounding her, all of whom are adopting ritual gestures with their hands. It's a mixed male, female. And this is an Orphic uh, ritual initiatory bowls. It, <laughs> its last known place of residence was New York, and it hasn't been seen or heard of since that. That's around the 1930s or 40s. So it's probably... <laughs> locked away in someone, some rich person's basement somewhere. I hope it still survives anyway, but it hasn't been seen for decades. Luckily, we have these photographs of it. It's a unique artifact. Um, just jumping a little, this is a, um, a mosaic from Zugma in southern Anatolia. And whilst it depicts Dionysus in the middle, supported by a satyr, on his left, the other figure is called Telete. She represents the spirit or, or of the initiatory energy itself. Okay. As an, so we will see a figure in the um, fresco sequence who is dressed in a similar way, all in purple. Okay. So they are representing the deity in a fundamental sense. Okay. So we're moving on now. That's just a close up there. And the next group are three women gathered around um, a box. And within that box will be a small herm like statue of Dionysus. And what they're doing there is basically blessing it. The woman on the right is pouring water onto a twig of uh, probably myrtle. And then this woman, who's dressed as a Roman priestess, is going to bless the herm and cleanse and purify it ready for ritual action to do so by flicking the liquid on onto it. Um, you can see from her large headdress that it, 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 it's covering a very elaborate herdu and we'll see that herdu being uh, made uh, at the end of the cycle for the new initiate. It's called the Seni Crine and it was characteristic of Roman priestesses, okay? And here's the feet of the stool she's sitting on has these very peculiar shapes, okay? Now, I, I went through literally dozens of pieces of Roman furniture, tables, chairs, couches. I never found any with feet like this, ugly feet. <laughs> so what I'm guessing here is that the artist has slipped into the frame a hint that the mushroom was an integral part of the ritual process. And if I was to guess which mushroom, I would have to say it's Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, okay? A very powerful hallucinatory drug normally. It, we'll it come would back just be to that shortly. It would just be too so. obvious if it was red with little white spots on it. Yeah, right? but, you <laughs> know, would give it away. <laughs> nice brown mushroom, you know, good. It's a good way of hiding the symbolism for sure. Yeah, it's amazing how he worked it into uh, into the frescoes in a kind of discreet way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we move on, and and the scene changes again because now we're out of um, ritual space and into supernatural space. Okay, all the figures here are either symbolic or supernatural figures, okay? First of all, we have Silenus, who is uh, Dionysus's tutor, he's playing the Cathara, and you just can make out a snake uh, climbing up that column. Um, so we start to see theriomorphic representations of the deity at this stage. 
okay, the animal form of the deity. There's two panisks sat here, one playing the panpipes um, and the other suckling a small goat, a kid. And then the black goat at the bottom is staring straight out at, again, a change of the chronotype so that, you know, breaks the flat picture surface to address the viewer, to throw your consciousness back on you, so to speak. And that, of course, is a depiction of Dionysus in the form of the black goat. Okay. Dionysus was suckled by these supernatural figures on Mount Nyssa. So this is a kind of rural idol that takes us back to the mythology of the deity, his upbringing, um, and introduces a set of musical instruments, the cathara, the panpipes, and there'll be another one, a hand drum that appears later. Uh, they're all very soft in terms of their you know, kind of tonal range, okay? Whereas when you see the, um, the banquets and festivities of Dionysus, the most common instrument is the orlos or the double orlos, which is a reeded, a short reeded instrument and really raucous, you know, think of bagpipes, the sound of bagpipes, bagpipes and, and, and drumming, you know. So this tells us a lot about the sound uh, landscape of the ritual process. The instruments in use um, define the sonic landscape. And, that, and that's quite an interesting thing from, from a performative perspective. The final figure is again, this standard representation. Uh, she's kind of throwing the cloak up as though to cover something and holding her hand out. She's, she's always described as the alarmed woman for some reason. And I don't know, you know, <laughs> The scene that's about to occur is part of the initiatory process. And what she's signaling is that you do not uncover that for anyone, okay? This is a warning that what you're about to see is forbidden, so to speak. She's not alarmed at all. There's nothing to be alarmed at, at this stage of the ritual anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is what she's looking at. And what we have is the central couple, Dionysus and Ariadne, flanked on either side by the two ritual processes that define the mysteries, Miasis and the Telete, Bacchic Telete itself, okay? So this is the east wall. Um, so let's look at the figures very quickly. First one, um, you, again, see Silenus. He's holding a bowl up uh, and the figure is peering into it and seeing a reflection of a, of, of a mask behind him. Now, the figure holding the mask also has a shield. So what this is, is a reference to Dionysus's murder by the Titans. When as a child, he's playing, he's looking in a mirror, uh, he sees his own reflection, and he's regarding that as they dance around him and then murder him. Okay, so metaphorically, um, what it's saying is that becoming enamored of your own reflection of materiality is the mechanism that draws you back into incarnation. Okay. That's the me and, and the ritual of dancing around the initiate is the purification ritual of myasis, okay, to prepare the initiate for. But the artist has been so skilled, he's able to pack all of these different dimensions of meaning into this small group. And on top of that, made the reference to um, making divination through a bowl of water, which mm -hmm. Silenus is, was known for doing. Now, the possibly a, a divination up. was taken mm -hmm. for each initiate. That, that, that would kind of be in accord with later higher rites of initiation. It has the, a divinatory aspect to it. The mask that's being held up, do you see that as the Titans or do you see that yeah, as, absolutely. Yeah. as a Titan? Yeah. Okay. It's, you know, that would be the Titans kind of, um, he would see that mask reflected in the water just at the point of his death. Okay, so that's the way the, the tale is told. 
Um, but it's his engagement with his own reflection, which is the fatal step, because it sucks the soul down into incarnation. Okay. So that's the first group. The second group, uh, we have Dionysus here, inebriated. One arm thrown up over his head is called the epiphanic gesture. Um, an epiphany is the, uh, the manifestation of the deity. Okay. So he is the deity, but he's also showing that at this stage in the rite, the deity is manifesting itself in the ritual space. An epiphany is occurring. One of his feet is shod and the other foot is slipshod, okay? And, and this monosandalus, you, you know, it, it has become a characteristic symbol of the initiatory process. Um, and you can trace that right back to like Jason and the Argonauts, uh, which is a, like almost like a Bronze Age tale. Uh, I think Jason loses a sandal as he crosses a river carrying the goddess Hera in, in disguise. But his loss of the sandal, of course, uh, alarms the king he's going to see. Uh, but it also signals that Jason is on an initiatory path. The large rod there is uh, Thersus. Uh, has a pine cone embedded in it, um, and it is the most defining symbol of, of Dionysian uh, ritual that I can think of, actually. So the god there, inebriated with energy, the energy of divinity, and he's, he's held so closely by Ariadne. Now, she's a really interesting figure. Um, because in this context, which is a, a women's ritual organization, she is the proto mystes. That's to say, she is the, um, the template to be followed in order to achieve union with the deity. Okay. She holds a skine in one hand, which is um, a great um, bound thread. And, and Ariadne, of course, is, is closely connected with the, the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. You know, really deep uh, early Bronze Age, kind of um, three, 4,000 years before this uh, fresco is painted. And the significance there, at least in Plato's Phaedo, is that the Labyrinth represents life itself. And you don't so much get lost in the labyrinth, but you always come out from where you went in. So that it kind of, you know, you go into the labyrinth, you wander round and round and round, and you come out and you're back where you started in essence. Um, so that Ariadne has the guide of the labyrinth. Okay, the thread is the guide to the labyrinth and can take you back quickly to the entrance. And the initiatory process is one of liberating you from the labyrinth, okay? Which is liberation from the endless cycle of incarnation, essentially. So the core Orphic concept is that you're kind of imprisoned here, as Plato says, like a, an oyster, a pearl oyster in a shell, locked in, okay? So this process was about spiritual liberation of the soul. And then we move on to the next scene, which and now we're talking about the Talete itself, the Bacchic Talete. This is in a highly sketched form how the ritual process uh, proceeded because they don't actually show you the, the crux, okay? We have to infer the crux. And the figure on the left, um, it, it has the Herm out and the cloth covering the statue of Dionysus is folded in such a way that it looks like a phallus. The lighter purple fold is almost like a phallus. And these things have been brought out of this winnowing basket, which is the traditional ritual container for the most sacred uh, objects of the mystery cult. A winnowing basket, of course, uh, would be used for blowing the husks off the corn, okay? It's like getting rid of the 
So it, it has a profound symbolic uh, function as well, getting rid of the externalities, getting down to the core, the soul. Above the uh, woman who's presenting those objects, uh, you can just make out um, two women dressed in green, one of them holding a tray uh, covered in pine needles on which is a golden ring. And when you look at the, the frescoes in total, um, most of the priestesses are wearing these heavy gold rings uh, with carnelian intaglio stone set in it, which would have been inscribed with um, figures um, which identified the wearer as a member of this secret cult. Okay. I found one of these rings for sale on, on eBay, believe it or not, a genuine gold Dionysian initiatory ring with carnelian stone still in place at a cool $15,000. So if anyone is inclined to <laughs> jump in, there you go. Um, Next to the woman is this supernatural figure with black wings and a whip. And she's wearing the nebris and buskins. These are, this define her as, as a, a supernatural figure closely related with Dionysus. The nebris is the speckled deer skin. Uh, the buskins are those characteristic uh, laced up boots. But this figure is no human figure. Her black wings uh, indicate that she's a supernatural figure. And she's got her arm right back, ready to unleash a whip onto the back of the woman across the corner of the room. And I have to, uh, <laughs> from my love of art, the way they've eliminated the crease of the corner of the room by making the action pour across it in such a dynamic way is absolutely phenomenal. The whiplash is coming from a figure called Lisa, and she was um, closely associated with the onset of mania, of, of inescapable excitement, enthusiasmos, which is to say enthused, that's to say entered, ridden by the deity. And that's, that's what is about to occur, but we're not showing how it's initiated. But let me say here that based on my analysis of Dionysus's mythic stories and on a number of other um, key clues, the, one occurs in Aristophanes play Frogs, for instance, where um, Dionysus is asking or somebody, uh, how do I get to the underworld? And they answer, well, go and hang yourself. And he said, no, I don't want to strangle myself. Okay, well, use the standard approach. You know, kind of, what's that? The pestle and mortar approach. Okay, so what were they going to grind down and how was that going to take, take the awareness to the underworld? And by putting these clues together, we can begin to form a picture of what's happening here. The mushrooms that we saw encoded earlier in the fresco cycle the use of a pestle and water. What would that produce if you ground down fly agaric? It would produce a compound of a very concentrated extract of the mushroom called muscimol. And the effects of muscimol is to trigger a kind of instantaneous ecstatic high. Now, if you ingested that stuff, you know, the, the acids in your mouth, your stomach, uh, the filtration system of your kidneys and liver would dilute the effects. It would take ages for it to, to act on you. So there's, there's only one way in the course of this short ritual process to get the full effect of that catalytic drug. And that's to administer it through the anal or rectal tissues, okay? In which case it goes straight into the bloodstream and immediately fills the initiate with this huge energy and also serves to stimulate the Kundalini because there's a connection between certain 
um, intensities of drug experience and the Kundalini energy, which were long been recognized and played with in these kind of mystery cults. And that doesn't mean that the effects of the drug explain the vision of the deity, okay? That's not the, you know, for, for years, people have thought, how did they, they see the gods? Oh, they're, well, they took mushrooms. No, it's not quite like that. <laughs> no, it's not that simple. The mushroom acts as a catalyst to the kundalini, the inner energy, and, and, and the increase of one's own inner energy opens up a dimension of awareness that allows you access to this ritual space. And this ritual space has been primed prior to the ritual to act as a container and an and attractor to a set of other than human beings and entities. And what they're doing now is fusing all these elements, the ritual space, the ritual dance, the muskimol, and the presence of the deities to people who are devoted to them. They're not, they're not tourists. These people are not there to see if it works. They're devoted to the deity. So what they've created is a meeting space for all these vectors to converge on each other and deliver what Walter Burkhardt, the classicist, called the extraordinary experience, which is the one thing that we know about all the ancient mystery cults. They delivered a direct encounter with a deity. And that is exactly what the higher yoga tantra of the Indo-Tibetan rites does today. So, you know, <laughs> something old, something new. Okay, so we move on. I believe that's what's happening. Um, and the result is on the right. The initiate is up and dancing in an ecstatic way. And the, the way they've depicted the, the scarf, this golden scarf, is almost as though they're, they're suggesting her aura is, is filled with gold. Okay, it's beautiful use of symbolism. So I'm, <laughs> I put this in for someone. This just depicts the women in green. This is actually a portion of the wedding of Dionysus and Ariadne um, that was found in, uh, as a mosaic in Zugma in Southern Anatolia. Unfortunately, um, this mosaic has been stolen. It was left in situ. It must have been stolen to order and probably adorned some very rich person's private villa somewhere today. Thankfully, we have these photographs of that mosaic and we can see the women dressed in green carrying the treasure chest. So that, that, that's how I identified the two women in green in the previous uh, slide as bearing the jewelry, okay, jewelry bearers. So, so we're coming now to the end. The, the enthusiasmos is over. This is the initiate. Um, she's now robed in this kind of golden, beautiful, um, beautiful golden robe with uh, kind of silk ties. Again, these Roman elite women <laughs> shared no, spared no expense on themselves. You can see the mushroom forms holding up the chair. I would say I've seen no Roman chair ever which has these ugly feet. But anyway, it serves to uh, embody or encode the mushrooms into the fresco cycle. She's looking directly out of the picture plane again. This is the third time the artist has used this. She gazes directly at you. She's having her hair tied in the form of, a, of the senicrine. That's, that's the, the ritual hairdressing of a Roman priestess. So presumably this ritual cycle has shown the initiation of a, of a priestess to the cult of Dionysus. The, the erotes, the little winged figure there, is clearly a supernatural one. And therefore the mirror that it's holding up to her is a supernatural mirror. It's the mirror of Dionysus again, okay? Except she's not looking into it anymore, okay? She's liberated from that gaze at herself at materiality. And that, in essence, is what the, the mysteries vouch, vouchsafe to people. That sense of liberation, that sense of a connection with a higher order of being and of a bigger um, 
horizon on the evolutionary process. And this takes us to the final figure, uh, often called the domina, as though she, she's the woman, she's the owner of the villa, people like to think of it. It may well have been. Uh, actually, the, the gestures and posture is, is standard, but the face may well have been um, the Roman patrician woman. Some people say it could even have been Livia. And anyone who's followed I Claudius will know that Robert Graves has, has done a, a big disservice. Again, you see the mushroom shapes at the bottom of the couch. Interestingly, the couch she's sitting on disappears into the wall. We only see half of it. And I believe that what the artist was attempting to uh, depict here is that while she remains in this plane, the material plane, she's now in a sense wedded to or united with a de de deity who exists on the other side, okay? Again, it's extremely subtle, metaphysical um, articulation that they've been able to affect within this fresco cycle. And you can see she's, she's got the ring on her finger, the red stone and the golden ring. Okay. She's dressed in the saffron and purple robes that we've seen the Roman uh, priestesses dressed in. Incredibly well-dressed Dionysian cult, you could say. <laughs> okay. Oh, so there's the book, the hard, hardback anyway. There's the paperback. And that's the presentation. Oh, that was uh, absolutely fantastic. That really... Okay got to the heart of things. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the last image there, the the woman who's on the sofa or the couch that yeah. is going into the wall. Yeah. It almost sounds like what you're suggesting is kind of a, a fourth dimensional thing. It's like how, uh, right. if, like in Flatland, right? When you have a two dimensional plane and you have a three dimensional yeah. object, uh, yeah. the two dimensional being would only see the little slivers of it. They wouldn't see yeah. the sphere. Um, yes. and, and fourth dimensional to our three dimensional, it would be something that kind of slightly comes into our existence in ways yeah. that we can't really comprehend, but it's not yeah. always going to be completely here. Is that kind of what you're uh, uh, saying? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. I, I mean, it's clever. It's, it's, it's a beautifully executed and thoughtful and metaphysically rich fresco. It's absolutely incredible. It survived pyroclastic flow at what temperature and at what speed <laughs> rolling down the mountain, flattening the, everything. And somehow the these frescoes damage. are preserved. And it was absolutely yeah. astounding. The only damage is to Ariadne, basically. And is that from the from the pyroplastic flow or, or any idea how we that We don't really happens? know. It was, the room was discovered by accident in 1912, okay? okay. And of course, you know, archaeology was pretty well in its infancy, infancy then. So there was kind of excavation process took place. And then over the years, there were a lot of clumsy efforts to try and preserve the frescoes. Um, and some of them, frankly, were disastrous. <laughs> so in 2017, anyway, um, the archaeological park got a huge grant from Europe and they set about working on the frescoes to remove a lot of the old varnish and glues and things that have been applied to it. And then they used an advanced laser technique to take off a microscopic layer so that all of a sudden we were able to see the colors exactly as they had been when they were painted at the time. The red walls, uh, the, the frescoes were done in two stages. First, they did the like three bands and they painted the red panels uh, with cinnabar, mm. which was the most expensive paint. Had to be brought from the Black Sea region. Um, it was so expensive. It, it, was, it had its own tax code and <laughs> costs and everything. Uh, no expense spared for this. this thing. And then when all the architectural features were in place, the like faux marble base, the cinnabar with the vertical columns and the lines drawn in it to give it like architectural depth and the beautiful faux marble around the top. When all that was done, they then went through and painted the figures on top of it. 
overlapping the architecture to, to give a sense of flow. So, you know, the figures are not bound in with columns around them. They overlap with each other and flow around. The chronotype, as I say, is both forward into the ritual process and out into the room to engage you as a viewer. And it all points, they're, they're mixing um, ritual with classical myth, with supernatural elements, and, and very clever, elusive ways of providing sufficient information for you to understand the ritual process. It's, it's just, you know, absolute masterwork. Astounding. I can't think of anything other like it, anything that can even approach it on the planet today. And it's beautiful. I mean, it really is telling that narrative where you just, you know, at the beginning, right, you have the, the priestess coming in and then you have the mythological figures arriving and they're being placated with honey cakes and all this. And then you get to the real depiction of the myth on the, on the one wall and, and just, you know, even the, the narrative structure where it's like, okay, you have Dionysus losing himself into his reflection. And then you yeah. have the 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 new priestess figure who is no longer looking at her reflection because she's learned yeah. the mysteries yeah. of Dionysus. So right? it's like you can draw lines across the room so that the figures also address each other from the new initiate to the woman who's now initiated, you know. There's a kind of line connecting the two. So, I wonder who the black goat is looking at <laughs> as the as Dionysus well, I think that's, incarnate. That's us. The the one when I started work on this uh, project, um, I had a, one of those intense dreams, you know, so it like stayed with me like it that happened. And the dream was I, I suddenly confronted a black goat. But the sense of beauty that overwhelmed, you know, just like a wave, you know, this was perfection hit me. Wow. And at the same time, this massive strength and vulnerability, as though it could just die, just like that, and then jump up again and die and then be back again. And that came across so powerfully. And, and you know, I knew then that this was the book I had to complete. It grabbed you. <laughs> it grabbed you. Know, you. Yeah. I knew this, this, this was the job that had to be done. These frescoes have been in my mind one way or the other for, um, I would say, the better part of half a century. With that dream, do you get the sense that a certain supernaturalness reached out to you to do this book? Oh, yeah. I mean, I get that with all my books. I had the, you know, with the game of Saturn, it was just the same except that was like daytime, like an energy, you know, <laughs> knocking wow. me out. No, this, this dream was, was, you know, I don't, I don't record my dreams. I, I don't re retail them. Um, I, I, I don't really remember them. I don't spend any time, but this one in all my life, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it and anything so significant, you know, Wow. Beauty, vulnerability, and a kind of inextinguishable, you know, coming back, you know, always coming back energy behind it. It was like, wow, <laughs> it's just awesome. And maybe it was Dionysus <laughs> himself. So ultimately, I like, think it's, yeah, I, I believe it, that these currents exist, you know, because yeah. I'm an energy healer, yeah. you know, and, and kind of the other than human is a part of that world. And, and, and so are higher order beings, an integral part of the world of energy healing. So I have no problem with that. Although I can see that art historians would have a big problem with of course. it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, it, it, it really is such a fascinating narrative being put forth in the frescoes. And so for the, for the viewers and for the listeners, um, you already kind of touched on it, but can you speak to what is the place of the cycle of life and death and rebirth within the mysteries? Like, how does the myth of the destruction of Dionysus play into this? And, and does there, is there a power of Dionysus to show a soul its true form? Is that what's going on in these mysteries? And also to make the question even longer, what role does the related symbolism of the labyrinth and Ariadne 
play in this. So, you know, okay. death and rebirth. Okay, and all so, that. Yeah. Okay. Let's. I can break that up if you want. No, no. <laughs> let, 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 let's go for it and let's see what comes out. <laughs> so, the myth or the sequence of myths around deities like Dionysus provide what would they call the atia. That's the rationale and structure for uh, parts of a ritual process, you know, key to a specific deity. And like archetypal themes can be drawn from the myth cycle of a deity, you know, the sacrifice of the deity. Dionysus is killed by the Titans, um, hazarding the underworld, you know, go, going down to bring his mother back from Hades. Um, the reunion consequent upon that, the sacred marriage with Ariadne, birth of a child, you know. So the murder of Dionysus by the Titans kind of provides the atia for the Corabantic rite, okay? He's killed whilst gazing into the, his reflection in the mirror, which is the metaphor for the absorption of the soul in matter. And it's, it's kind of attraction into incarnation. Um, and I can, if there's a quote here, um, the souls of men seeing their image in the mirror of Dionysus, as it were, have entered into the realm in a leap down from the Supreme. This is Plotinus. Okay, so there is clear awareness about these metaphoric readings um, in the ancient world. Okay, you know, his descent to the underworld to redeem his mother was facilitated by a shepherd who offered to show him the way in return for a sexual favor, okay? Uh, and when he came back, the shepherd had died. So he went to his grave, he cut a branch of a fig tree and, and self-sodomized himself, you know, with that, okay? So again, the use of the dildo is part of this initiatory process of descent to the underworld and return is embedded in the myth. Okay, so the myth serves as the atia to the right, and the right enables you to, so to speak, undergo the spiritual experience indicated by a metaphoric reading of the myth. Okay, so they make a, a kind of circle. Um, the marriage of Dionysus and Ariadne um, is like the recovery of a primordial unity through. Um, union with a deity so awareness so we need to talk about the role of possession cult uh, within this context and what i want to say about that is that uh, possession exists on a spectrum of intensities okay it isn't just like an on off switch okay so the greater the devotion and practices directed to a deity um, the more that a voluntary possession by the deity is, is kind of facilitated, okay? So for all of the people taking part in the second part of the, 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 the Bacchic tele, Telete, not the Miasis, the people who go on for full initiation, they're all devotees. But, but I mean, they're devotees within the group, the larger group of devotees, okay? They're that, you know, that close to the, the current that the deity represents. So they're seeking this possession by, or in, in the, like the voodoo sense, to be ridden by the deity, be absorbed, and to then have this experience of God consciousness, even for a brief period, because it completely relativizes the ego and the rest of life. <laughs> Nothing's quite the same thereafter, let's say. Um, I hope this is helping to, <laughs> to yes. answer your question. Uh, absolutely. Okay. You come out of that um, completely changed, right? I mean, and this is yeah. also what the fresco is hinting at, right? That yes. it's almost like yes. um, it prepares you for death, really, because it, it gives you an idea of what is real, the ultimate reality. And you kind of know, it, 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 is it, is the ultimate um, point of this? to free one from the cycle of rebirth? I guess from kind of a modern Buddhist perspective, they would probably say 
Well, if you enacted rights like this in several lifetimes, you would probably achieve that goal. I see. Okay. Right, um, right. But I heard Dalai Lama once talk about the subtle continuity of being. And I think um, on, a, on a lower level, it gives you the direct confidence in the existence of that passing through processes of death and birth and, and, and life again, you know. So when that becomes part of your conscious awareness, part of your frame of reference, then it changes your relationship to material reality fundamentally. Right, right. Yeah. So it might not free you, but it's preparing you for death. You're not going to be afraid of it, perhaps, after going yeah. through. And, and that's critical because, I mean, just from an energy healing perspective, the amount of trauma that we experience uh, from clients coming to us uh, trauma of uh, or traumatic experiences of death in previous lives makes a mark which continues in subsequent lives. So actually the, the ability to, to um, accept the death process, to enter into it, to raise your awareness and let go is critical in the overall economy of the spirit, let's say. Mm -hmm. It reminds you know, that, me that is a spiritual discipline that I'm describing there. It reminds me of the death of Socrates, right? Where he goes yeah, to absolutely. his death completely yeah, ready absolutely. for it. And of I'm course, glad he was you mentioned initiated. that, Eric, because <laughs> that is mentioned in Plato's Phaedo, isn't it? Plato's Phaedo, that dialogue is all about the last hours of Socrates. Mm -hmm. And the structure of that dialogue is based on Ariadne and the labyrinth. Really? Yeah. So now we come back to... <laughs> it's been ages since I read it, so wow. Yeah. I found an academic paper on that subject. You may want to just Google it, and um, you'll, you'll see it there anyway. So, um, so Ariadne holding this scheme, this thread, which is the guide through the labyrinth, serves as a metaphor for... Um, being lost in the labyrinth and finding your way out of it, okay? Um, so that in her case, seeking union with the deity, the wedding of Dionysus and, and Ariadne, um, is, is like suggesting that it's only through the union with the deity that you can achieve a real escape from the overwhelming effect of the labyrinth. Okay, so right. it, it's again, it's like the mirror of Dionysus, this, this being drawn into and attracted to materiality, finding yourself in the labyrinth of life yet again, with all the you know, dumb stuff that's going on around us, like these days. Um, and th this is kind of characteristic of life on this planet and possibly other planets. So there's a real need to raise our ethical and spiritual dimensions to overcome this deadening materiality. You know, that's kind of the struggle, isn't it? And I guess that was probably what, a, what attracted a lot of people towards the mystery rites in antiquity, I'm guessing. Right. Well, it, you know, it has a profound ethical uh, dimension to it as well. Well, and the other part of it was that they needed to give results, right? I mean, if you entered into this, you were going to have one incredible life-changing experience, whether you're ready for it or not, right? I mean, I did suppose it could have been absolutely overpowering for some, and yet, uh, you know, and, and yet it is that kind of apotheosis type event for others. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have some quotes by people who are incredibly well placed to comment on the ritual process. I mean, one here from uh, Plutarch of Chaeronea, who was an initiate, of course, he was a, a priest at the Delphic or Oracle, initiate into many of the religions. And he says, at the point of death, the soul suffers something like 
what those who participate in the great initiation suffer. Mm -hmm. So he's comparing the process of dying to initiation. He says, hence, even the word dying is like the word to be initiated. And the act of dying is like the act of being initiated. Um, Interesting. And there's another one here, Deodorus Siculus, uh, again, a, a, a writer contemporary with the Villa of the uh, Mysteries. He says, the claim is also made that men who've taken part in the mysteries become both more pious and more just and better in every respect than they were before. So, the, you know, these are important bits of testimony from people who were, you know, close up, close to the rites. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to preparing for the mysteries, and I suppose this is getting into the, the technique of it, right? Yeah. Um, how did one prepare for the mysteries? So I suppose there would be two different ways of preparing, right? You're preparing one for the, uh, the cleansing ceremony yeah. that the majority of people yeah. went through. And then I guess there would be a preparation for the, the next bout, right? So how, how did people prepare? Well, we don't actually have uh, specific information about that. We, we, we know generally that miasma uh, had to be cleansed. Okay, but um, I'm guessing, and it is a guess, that pretty well they would do the same things that any of us would do if we were contemplating uh, taking oath and initiation into one of the higher yoga tantra. Right. I say there'd be, you know, preliminary preparation would include like fasting, physical purification, you know, detox. We know that in Eleusis, for instance, they bathed in seawater. Um, there'd be <clears throat> a regime of chastity, um, quiet contemplation, simple devotional activity so that you maintain a focus on what it is that you're contemplating uh, and prayer, you know, uh, and in addition to that, all the ritual clothing and implements would need to be specifically prepared and purified. We saw those leather shoes the initiate was wearing. I'm sure they were specially prepared just for that event. Um, I, I can't see those shoes referenced in any other context other than that <laughs> worn by the initiate in that fresco cycles. Um, so, yeah, pretty general, really. Um, they're all things that we'd recognize today as prep preparatory activities. I, I, I don't think they've altered a bit in millennia. <laughs> well, there is, there is one uh, that you mentioned in the book that really stood out to me. And I suppose this was dealt, this was used to deal with miasma and that was yeah. the, the Corinantic uh, dance. What can you say about that? Cause that sounds incredibly impressive. Okay. So, um, let me think now. So it was used to conduct the preliminary rite um, of Miasis, okay? And I've got a quote here, actually, from Plato. It occurs in his dialogue, Euthydemus. And he says, he's talking, actually, about two people who are debating. And he compares their activity to the Corabantic initiation ceremony. He says, these two are doing just the same as those in the Corabantic initiation ceremony when they conduct the enthronement rite. So the, the person who's, who's, who's undergoing the rite sits on, a, on, on a, a stone or a throne or whatever, and the priests dance around him. Um, now, the, the locus classicus for this is in Jason and the Argonauts once more. And you may recall that they are entertained by the king of Kizikus in the Sea of Marmara. And then the next day they set out and the wind blows them ashore on the other side of the peninsula. And um, in the night, the king comes across with all his men and they don't recognize each other. And so they, they end up murdering their host. And when, when the sun rises, they realize what they've done so that they're covered in miasma. They have, you know, done the worst thing they've they've shed innocent blood they've you know to a person who was a host of theirs so they go up on uh, the mountain uh, there and they prepare a rough um, statue of the goddess of the mountain and then in full armor they dance around it clashing their 
swords on their shields, okay, to drive away the, the Arignes, the, the Furies, and to atone for what they've done. So the Corabantic dance is a form of that, okay. Uh, of course, it's much more civilized in the Hellenistic world. The Jason and the Argonauts tale seems to hark back to the Bronze Age or something. Um, and what Plato then says, for in that situation, there's dancing and jesting, as you know, if you've been initiated. So he's, he's, he's actually comparing the, the two people debating with another person to the execution of the Corabantic dance. So, you know, I say these little gems are, are hidden away in the classical literature. They throw a little light on the topic. Um, the Corabantic dance is generally a high stepping dance in which you clash a sword on a shield, you know. But here, of course, it, you know, something, something similar to that, dancing around someone, gesticulating, making jokes, threatening them is, is, is like generating the energy to cleanse them. And the reason it works is because it is a, um, a facsimile or a simulcra of the Titans dancing around Dionysus. Okay, so it reflects sacred action, which is outside of time and therefore is always occurring, never lapses. And you like plug into that source as, as somebody existing in time. And you draw upon that timeless energy to energize the ritual and make it effectual. I don't know. I hope that makes sense. Yes. And actually it gets to the next question that I had, which was how music and movement were being used to bring humans into harmony with creation, right? Within the book, you talk about counter movement to symbolize the stars and the planets and like two different rings moving in different directions to symbolize, you know, the movement on the ecliptic and then the movement of the stars. Uh, that part seemed very interesting, how, how dance yeah. was being used to connect with the harmony of creation. In, in the context of the mysteries, it's extremely speculative. Um, because it's the one thing that is not depicted in the fresco cycle and which nobody ever talks about, which is the actual Bacchic Talete, the actual process of initiation itself is not described anywhere. Um, but we know that all of the mysteries were danced. So the question is, what dance would they use? Okay, now it perhaps doesn't matter. I mean, they could use, the standard kind of wedding dance. Uh, and again, Theseus, uh, when he arrives at Crete with the youngsters, performs a dance kind of on the beach. It's called the crane dance or the garanos. And that's one of the sacred dances. And it kind of, um, I, I see it enacted here by the uh, certain groups. It continues to be enacted as a sacred dance here in Anatolia, by the way. And it's kind of unitive. It's like a, a wedding dance. So that would function for initiation. And then perhaps something which reflected the women who cared for Dionysus. And, and they were catasterized, let's say, um, turned into stars as the Pleiades and the Hyades. They were, you know, uh, so they are the two constellations that form Taurus, the bull. And the bull is one of the theriomorphic forms of Dionysus. So they're, in a sense, embedded in his celestial body. So a dance that, um, based upon <laughs> the relationship outside of time, of these stars as embody, embodiments of the women who looked after him, performed on the planet, would again plug into that um, timeless energy. That would be another way of doing it. So what I'm trying to suggest is that it's possible to construct a ritual by drawing on uh, threads within the mythic framework, the mythic cycle of the deity. Okay. We don't know what they actually did. I mean, my guess is that a wedding dance would work perfectly. 
it's it's very curious because yeah, what I'm hearing is that they are they're pulling in energy, right? They have regardless of what dance they were doing or how the ceremony yeah. was arranged, they are pulling on certain strands of energy and bringing that into the, which then brings in the dragon symbolism, which I thought was very curious because I haven't really encountered this elsewhere. It's this, um, as you were you were mentioning with that Orphic bowl that went missing in the yeah. 30s, right? There's this yeah. importance of this dragon symbolism in relation to uh, the priestess. And, and so what, what do you feel this is? Is it an energy that they're channeling into? What is the Dracana? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, the couplings of all the deities um, of, of Kronos with Thea, of Zeus with Hera, of um, Zeus with Persephone, are all performed in the theriomorphic form of Dracaena, of dragons or serpents, okay? It's one word in Greek, Dracaena, okay? So, um, so clearly that, the, you know, just as the goat is one of the theriomorphic forms, the um, bull is a theriomorphic form, the dragon is another one, but it's, it's like of another order of intensity because it, it's so, um, one of the features of ritual space is it serves to trigger the Kundalini energy. So a powerfully formed ritual space will tend to energize the, the inner energy, which has, you know, phenomenal, phenomenologically, um, the texture of a serpent or dragon, and hence the serpent power and Kundalini and so on, are all assimilated uh, to that image, that symbol. So I think that's where it comes in. Um, a powerful initiatrix who has dedicated her life to this deity and to the rituals and uh, initiatory process um, would cultivate that inner energy. You know, that would be her stock in trade, so to speak. Because when you're in the presence of somebody with a high level of Kundalini energy, it already serves to energize the space. It's contagious. And then the ritual. Basically. Yeah, the ritual process then builds on that. And then the ritual space building on it makes the Kundalini even more alive. And, and then you're bringing in, as you say, these celestial and, and, and hyper celestial energies because you're, you're moving closer to the deities that you seek to, seek to affect union with. Well, it only happens because the deities accept that. And so to speak, reach down. So you, you, you've got like the, the perfect storm <laughs> of forces converging onto the initiatory process. And I think it is that sophisticated. It's not, you know, it's not, you know, something you just read a manual and you can do it, you know, without the devotion, without the cultivation. Um, because ultimately the relationship to the divinity, to the deity, is a relationship in, in the fullest sense. 100%. As in that energy is not like on off switch, you know, with the electric lights or something. It's, it's a relationship it's, being created between the priestesses and that deity, right? It's not something that you can just steal the ritual and go do it without creating yeah. that relationship first, yeah. right? I mean, a ritual without that um, relationship is theater. You know, you could enact any of these rituals on, on a stage, wouldn't necessarily bring the gods a running, you know. <laughs> I'm probably going to ask you to engage in complete um, uh, intuition here, if you will. Um, what do you think, because I'm guessing that the, the actual um, evidence might be lacking, but mm. what do you feel, uh, so pure speculation probably, but what do you feel it was like in that room at the height of the ritual? What's going on? What are the priestesses doing? What are the uh, participants doing? Like what, what's going on in that room at the height of the Talete? I think that um, kind of 
I think what you're asking is about phenomenology rather than process, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, and what I would say is that the energies become so intense that there is an interleaving of space and time within the ritual space so that you cease to be conscious of doing a ritual. Okay. There's a sense in which you, you become one with the deities. I mean, the celebrants are all there as representatives of some part of the deity's myth cycle. So the priestesses may be uh, acting as the nursemaids of Dionysus. So, and again, so on an individual basis and on a group basis, you're, you're mirroring uh, events in the mythic atemporal world to such an extent and, and, and it's such high levels of energy that the two blend into, because possession cult is, is contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, e e even for an involuntary anthropologist sneaking in to see, you know, a ritual that they've been forbidden to attend, it's going to take them over. And, uh, you know, there's one excellent example of that in the um, ethnographic record. An Australian um, anthropologist was not invited to a ritually called death divination. And he snuck in and, you know, as he was watching it, you know, he felt the Kundalini energy rising up his spine. And then it was like snapped in his head. And all of a sudden he was looking on the ritual space except now it was illumined with light pouring out of the hands of the ritual dancers around this corpse. And he says, the corpse got up off the bier and started dancing and drumming. You know, this is crazy space. You know, would somebody completely disengaged from the ritual have seen the corpse dancing? I doubt it. But for everyone there, they had entered a space in which that was happening. And, and it was a transpersonal experience. It was not subjective. Okay, it existed, but on a different plane. And that's what I suspect um, these kind of powerful uh, mystery initiations actually um, felt like. And, and, you know, we can, again, um, read accounts of them. I'm trying to think of who. Um, let me just see if I have one. I need to dig one out for you. But uh, I think it's, again, Plutarch. He, he talks about um, how, as the ritual builds up, there's like an influx of Catholic deities and entities, okay, or entities in the ritual space. And some people are like panicked, you know, with the, you know, and that's just the entourage of the deity arriving before the deity itself. Okay. So there's a genuine sense of, of entering uh, a bit like, I don't know, the alien abduction experience. You're, you're in a, a reality now in which you have lost the touchstone of physical reality. And yet you're experiencing things which are, you know, so far out. Uh, they're not credible in a day-to-day -day form of consciousness. They, they simply couldn't happen, but they're nevertheless happening. <laughs> and, and he something. says, those who persist in it pass through that, you know, the sweating and fear, and they find themselves in these meadows and the deities are there. They can see them and worship them from close up. And it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and, and something you mentioned before we started recording is that you feel that probably the ritual energy was enough to get people into that that state of mind that we mentioned the potential use of avenida muscaria and and mushrooms but you feel that perhaps that was only used maybe the first time that someone was in the ritual to kind of prime them to get them into the into the right mindset to have these experiences but after that they might actually just be going along with the 
the energy in the room, right? Yeah, I mean, that's my belief. I mean, based on uh, looking at um, initiatory rituals in hunter-gatherer groups, they used, they used entheogenic you know, or psychoactive substances for people who are fresh to the ritual process because it's, it's almost like the, they need to get them over the hump of clinging to material reality so that they can accept the situation and then partake in the ritual process to build energy, okay? It, it's like an accelerant. But once it's happened, you don't need to go on taking psychoactive substances. It becomes irrelevant to the ritual process. So, you know, I, I think very much the muscamol was probably used in that way. I don't think it was a wholesale dosing on it. You know, the priests, the priestesses, uh, who are enacting the rites are already in this thing, you know, they, they're in it as a day-to-day -day commitment to do it through their preparation and because of their own immediate and intimate connection with the deity. You don't need that kind of thing. They, they feel the energy immediately. And, and we know this again from energy healing, you know, just before we do initiation process, the energy changes in the room. You know, you have a sense of presence there, even, you know, before you start even the opening of the ritual to do the initiation, the energy is already there because it wants to, it to happen. So obviously this makes a lot of, um, a lot of um, challenges to a materialistic mindset. You, you need to be on a far more animistic wavelength for any of this to make sense. <laughs> frankly <laughs> absolutely i mean the interaction with spirits is a huge huge part of what's going on here right so absolutely yeah, it, it absolutely it, is it's the whole game yeah it requires a, a different comprehension of consciousness that's for yeah. sure you mention in the book that there would be certain signs that the officiants would look for in the participants after um, to, to make sure that they had that experience, right? That there were certain okay. signs that they looked for after the Tulay. Yeah. What well, do you think some no, of the signs would be? I think the key thing is that um, a rite which is built around the hierogamy of the deity and uh, or, or Dionysus and Ariadne becomes the central visionary experience for the initiate. Now, the only question is, uh, how much detail can they recollect afterwards? And that will give the priestesses a very clear idea of just how deep into the process they were able to go. Okay, and I know this not from um, studying the Hellenistic mysteries, but from the Indo-Tibetan rites of the higher yoga tantra. Okay, there's an incredibly complicated and deep visionary experiences at the core of this. And the more you undergo the initiatory process, the more you purify and cleanse your own channels and generate energy, the deeper you'll see into it. So having initiated initiatrix there, having priestesses there, simple interrogation of what they actually saw at the crux of the um, initiation will tell them exactly how deep they were into the thing. So you feel that this would be something that um, someone would keep going back to. They would keep going through these rites and they would oh, get deeper and deeper. How often yeah, would definitely. they throw them? It's exactly like that uh, today as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do it one off. Uh, they attempt the sadhana and then after three or four months, you know, they do the sadhana once or twice a week. And then six months later, it's like once a month. <laughs> <laughs> and then the following year, it's okay, well, I kind of forgot about it. I can't get into it again. So, okay, that, that is fairly normal because the sedanas are, you know, it takes a real commitment to get up early in the early hours of the day and, and get into a posture and start doing the stuff. Um, but the people who do, are subjected to an ever increasing level of inner energy. So doing, doing the sadhana or the thurgy, as it would have been called in Hellenistic times, um, deepens the experience considerably. 
So when it becomes a daily practice, of course, you're, you're on a real pathway to transformation in that case, yeah. Now, let's say we I'm have sorry, a person. Uh, oh, uh, each ahead. time you experience the deity again, the origination, originatory experience recurs with each sadhana. You actually go there again. Okay, I just want, it's not like it was a one-off. It's always accessible to you. It sounds like one of those experiences where you want to have it, but then you also probably treat it with trepidation every single time because it's such a huge, mind-blowing event, right? I mean, if you had someone who's new... scared the life out of most people in absolutely. the Hellenistic world. <laughs> if if and, you had... And, go ahead. They were not doing it in a, you know, they, like it's Samothrace, you have to descend into a dark valley at night with a torch to be met with the priest down in the valley somewhere and go and go and confront the deity itself. Yes. It's <laughs> something else, you know. It's something else. <laughs> the thrill seekers of the ancient world. <laughs> yeah, you had to be pretty determined. Now also Samothrace is an island, you know, you could only get there with a, a sea voyage during the sailing season. And then because of that, they, they cram all the ritual into one day. You come there, you do the maesis, and then night comes and down you go, off you go into the valley. Good luck. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> with a torch, you know, down this steep path. You don't know what was going to meet you at the bottom, you know. So, yeah, um, it, 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 it requires a bit of commitment. <laughs> well, that, that's a core thing of initiation, though, right? The fear. There always has to be some fear. Some, it's the uh, unknown, isn't it? You know? Absolutely. And, yeah, and so being ready to I face that. When, when life uh, gets to a certain point, um, you overcome that sufficiently to do it. Right? The mm. other options are, are, are all of a sudden become weaker than actually doing that. So <laughs> whatever's going to happen is going to happen and you, you, you get on with it. <laughs> well, we were having a, a similar conversation uh, in our last interview when we were talking about the power of the healing field. And yeah. you were mentioning that there are some spiritual practices that are just so heavy hitting that, yeah. you know, they're, they're for people who are ready for that. But sometimes, you know, you need the the smaller steps, right? And I suppose that's what the um, the, clear, the the first in, in, in initiation the clearing the miasma, about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could do that a few times and kind of ease your way into it, maybe. Um, but yeah, in, in a healing context, like you know, the full on rebirthing, or you know, the they're very intense, and you have to be careful with intensity. It shouldn't become re-traumatizing. You know, you shouldn't. You shouldn't uh, gain an, uh, an aversion to the practice. Absolutely. So, you know, it's always trying to balance uh, the two things. Progress with not going over the top. And nobody should actually die because of the initiation. Yes. <laughs> Just symbolic. Just symbolic. That's axiomatic. <laughs> oh, my. Um, so when if you had someone who was new, to all of this, right? So you had someone who's undergoing their first initiation here, uh, their first rites within this room. What is there any kind of textual evidence for how that would change the relationship with the deity? So, you know, you go in there, you're already probably a devotee of that deity, but you're then having this possession experience. It would seem to create this closer connection. So do we have any idea of what kind of pledges would be made to that deity or any any kind of change in relationship any more intensified relationship with that being yeah definitely i mean the follow-up practices which essentially the follow-up to initiation is thergy uh you know which is your your do-it-yourself sadhana which is a mixture of prayers and, and devotions and, and, you know, the fasting purification goes on. Whatever rhythm and pattern you establish for that, you go on with it. Um, so that even within the Hellenistic theasoi, that's the, the groupings of devotees, um, the ones who have actually gone the full way, um, we're, we're like one third amongst the devotees. Okay. But they, they were distinct. 
they were, you know, uh, I think Plato somewhere says that there's, there's many people carrying the thyrsus, you know, the, the symbol of Dionysus, but the real Bacchae are very tr few. He uses that phrase somewhere. So yeah, the, you know, people recognize that some people have gone the extra step and they have this extra insight and energy and connection to the deity that they lack, you know. And in a sense that, you know, for some people, I think that is kind of comforting to know that some people are, are taking the spiritual path further forward. And that, that they find that reassuring to know that there's people in the community um, who are like carrying that energy and that, that, that healing energy, essentially. So good thing all over. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, definitely would seem to be a very small elite who are doing that. But at the same time, it's, uh, yeah, would they have a, sp a special role within the community after that? Like, would they be seen as healers or would they be seen as, or was everything pretty much going on within these initiation rituals? Very difficult to answer. Yeah. Um, we know that they definitely had a kind of, um, community leadership role. Um, for instance, uh, there's one theasoid, that's to say, organization of devotees, um, which was led by a local aristocratic family, just as the Villa of the Mysteries must have had a leadership role, political leadership role, given that they were the Roman elite, they were probably governing Pompeii. But the fact that they also had this other angle to them, that they were, were exhibiting um, the cultural sensitivity in a Hellenistic, um, ethnic and linguistic zone to submit themselves to the rights and to provide the resources for people to join in with this is something, that's another dimension, you know, we, we haven't really considered. I do cover that a little more in the book. I discuss that elite side of the uh, community. Um, so th there's practical stuff like sponsoring the feasts and the festivities in a community, but uh, there's also the deeper thing that they, um, they sponsor the actual ritual process and provide a space for it to be enacted in. Um, to do their own initiation rituals, they were probably bringing the Greek um, lineage holders from Neapolis, that's to say Naples. And we know that in Naples, there was a Dionysian technite, that's to say a, uh, the Dionysian artists, that's a group of initiates who had multiple skills. For instance, they included priests and priestess, but also all kinds of painters, dancers, um, the people necessary to put on a, a festival of Dionysus and to, uh, for instance, dance the initiation rituals in, in an initiation process. So they would all be uh, professionals and, and a, a rich family uh, such as exi existed in Pompeii and other cities would be capable of hiring these people. So that smaller towns and villages will be able to put on these rites and festivities and bring initiation to the people. It's, a, it's an aspect we don't know much about. We only have one uh, good example of this taking place. So it's difficult to speculate specifically about Pompeii, but in other towns and cities, we know that it did happen, yeah. So, so it's a kind much, of leadership. Hmm. Well, and, and therefore it was interwoven into the society in a big way, Absolutely. it would seem. So yeah. I guess my, my last question for you, and it's a really mm. big question, <laughs> um, and I suppose it kind of maybe ties into your other book, The Game of Saturn, but have these rituals carried on? So did they survive to the Renaissance? Where did the mysteries go after the sacking of the ritual centers in the late fourth century? Okay, so this is going to be the topic of the book coming out this summer or autumn from Scarlet Imprint. And essentially, it picks up the tale of the mysteries of Eleusis, um, which was sacked at the end of the fourth century. But the last hierophant, Nestorius, and his son, Plutarch of Athens, who was a priest of Asclepius, trained Plutarch's daughter, 
to perform the ritual initiation of Eleusis and to train people in Turgy. In effect, she became the last and greatest priestess of the Hellenistic world. And for the rest of her life, uh, until she died around 480, so pretty well most of the fifth century, she initiated and trained all of the major Neoplatonists in Thurgy. That includes Hierocles, uh, Proclus, Damascius, all of them. And this is something that's not often talked about, that it is actually the, just as the um, initiatory um, group in Pompeii was, a, was run by women, for women, in this case, a woman carried the initiatory torch for most of the fifth century and initiated all of those great Neoplatonic philosophers, but she's almost never mentioned, which is extraordinary. Asclepia Janea, her name was. Sounds like a real life Ariadne <laughs> carrying yeah. the thread. Yeah, absolutely. She, was, she lived a chaste life and all she did was initiate and train in Thurgy all her life served alongside Proclus actually. So she was the trainer of the Neo, great Neoplatonists. And that tradition was then carried from Athens into Alexandria. Um, Hermias and then um, Olympiodorus, I think was the last of the great Neoplatonic teachers in Alexandria. And his student, um, Olympiodorus was a mathematician and Ammonius was also a mathematician, just as Proclus was. They trained the architects of the Hagia Sophia. Okay, so I, I, I find in the architecture and the interior design of the Hagia Sophia, uh, the embodiment of the spiritual tradition. And that, that, that's all going to be in the forthcoming book from Scarlet Imprint. Um, but th that's one thread. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is very little evidence. I only found one re reference to it. I think it was Michael Pacellus in the ninth or 10th century says the initiations of Ceres, which in other words, Demeter, in other words, the rites of Eleusis could still be obtained in Athens as, as late as the seventh, eighth century. And that's extraordinary. I can't find any more evidence of that. But I know one thing that both Asclepiogenea and Proclus, as they grew old, um, were obsessed with finding people um, who could carry the tradition on. But at this point, under Christian oppression, it would have been deep underground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. this was something that could get you killed, I'm sure, right? Yeah. So there's a real discontinuity then from the fifth and sixth centuries to um, the work Platon was doing in the 15th century, the kind of revived Platonic thergy that he was um, um, proselytizing actually uh, as a return of the whole world to paganism. But there's a big disconnect there, a lot of blank centuries in terms of that tradition. Do you get any sense from the work of Platon that he wasn't just going by books that were being translated, that he actually made contact with some kind of stream of, of influence going through um, society, something underground that he might have? Contacted? Yeah, it wouldn't be so underground, you know, because if once you accept the deities there are there, so to speak, then it's open to anyone. I mean, he was certainly a devotee. And he rebuilt all of the thergic practices for each and every one of the deities, a full liturgy, naturally. And he was teaching it down in Mystra in the Peloponnese, you know, well away from Constantinople. So they, you know, and it's that system that I think he attempted to, um, to, to sell to the elite in Italy, and which, uh, from my perspective, is illustrated in the cards of the Sola Busca Taraki, where there's clearly a set of ritual cards in there, um, which are distinctly Hellenistic and can only have come from Platon. So yes, yes, that, that really has been my job these 
these past, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that upcoming book, tracing yeah. that, that movement through the centuries of the mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We'll, we'll hear more about it, I hope. Now the Scarlets are back from holiday, um, pressing on with the new productions for the summer or autumn, probably, autumn, winter this year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> well, that, fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, Peter, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. I've taken almost two hours of your time, and this is very oh, much is my pleasure. You know, it's I, I, I love these topics. Do you have anything that you want to to leave the the audience with regarding the mysteries or or anything There's like the that? Book. There's the book. Get the paperback at least. It is the single most important esoteric narrative to have survived from the lost world of Greco-Roman paganism. Absolutely, that, everyone. It, you know, either that resonates with you or it doesn't. So. <laughs> well, it's a fascinating book and how it fits in because, you know, I, I don't care what esoteric tradition you're coming from, right? Whether you're coming from occultism or any kind of, you know, paganism or shamanism or all this, you can see so many things resonating in, in Mistai, in, in the text uh, that you can bring into your life because it's just like, you can see the technology that they were using at this yeah. moment in time to connect with the divine. And you can absolutely, you know, back engineer that into your own practice. So I, I, yeah. I absolutely love the text. Absolutely. I encourage everyone to go pick it up. It's from Scarlet yeah. Imprint, everybody. Awesome. Well, well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. And I My definitely, pleasure. I look forward to talking about your next book. Yeah, yeah, me too. Awesome. Hopefully yeah. later this year. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. You have an amazing day and uh, I'll, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, you take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.